Good morning. Today is the second Sunday after the Epiphany, and this is a service of morning prayer. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. I was glad when they said unto me, we will go into the house of the Lord. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open now our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his hand, he made it and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, and with righteousness to judge the world and the peoples with his truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Psalm 79. O God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled and made Jerusalem an heap of stones. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the air, and the flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the land. Their blood have they shed like water on every side at Jerusalem and there was no man to bury them. We are become an open shame to our enemies, a very scorn and derision unto them that are round about us. 
Lord, how long wilt thou be angry? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire forever? Pour out thine indignation upon the heathen that have not known thee, and upon the kingdoms that have not called it upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob, and laid waste his dwelling place. O remember not our old sins, but have mercy upon us, and that soon, for we are come to great misery. Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of thy name. O deliver us and be merciful unto our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore do the heathen say, Where is now their God? O let the vengeance of thy servants' blood that is shed be openly showed upon the heathen in our sight. O let the sorrowful sighing of the prisoners come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, preserve thou those that are appointed to die. And for the blasphemy wherewith our neighbors have blasphemed thee, Reward thou them, O Lord, sevenfold into their bosom. So we that are thy people and sheep of thy pasture shall give thee thanks forever, and will always be showing forth thy praise from generation to generation. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Psalm 80. Uh, Hear, O thou shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock. Show thyself also, thou that sittest upon the cherubim. Before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and help us. Turn us again, O God, and show the light of thy countenance, and we shall be whole. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry with thy people that prayeth? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears, and givest them plenteousness of tears to drink. Thou hast made us a very strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Turn us again, thou God of hosts. Show the light of thy countenance, and we shall be whole. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou madest room for it. When it had taken root, it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it, and the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedar trees. She stretched out her branches unto the sea, and her boughs unto the river. Why hast thou then broken down her hedge, that all they that go by pluck off her grapes? The wild boar out of the wood doth root it up, and the wild beast of the field devour it. Turn thee again, thou God of hosts, look down from heaven, behold and visit this vine, and the place of the vineyard that thy right hand hath planted, and the branch that thou madest so strong for thyself. It is burnt with fire and cut down, and they shall perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, and upon the Son of Man whom thou madest so strong for thine own self. And so will not we go back from thee. O let us live, and we shall call upon thy name. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, Show the light of thy countenance, and we shall be whole. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, 
and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Psalm 81. <laughs> Sing we merrily unto God our strength. Make a cheerful noise unto the God of Jacob. Take the psalm, bring hither the tabret, the merry harp with the lute. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon, even in the time appointed and upon our solemn feast day. For this was made a statute for Israel and a law of the God of Jacob. This he ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he came out of the land of Egypt and had heard a strange language. I eased his shoulder from the burden and his hands were delivered from making the pots. Thou calledest upon me in troubles and I delivered thee and heard thee what time as the storm fell upon thee. I prove it thee also at the waters of strife. Hear, O my people, and I will assure thee, O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me. There shall no strange God be in thee, neither shalt thou worship any other God. I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I shall fill it. But my people would not hear my voice, and Israel would not obey me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and let them follow their own imaginations. Oh, that my people would have hearkened unto me. For if Israel had walked in my way, I should soon have put down their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. I would have fed them also with the finest wheat flour, and with honey out of the stony rock would I have satisfied thee. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Here beginneth the eighth chapter of the book of the prophet Zechariah. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with a great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, in truth and in righteousness. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to, pay, to pray before the Lord, and to seek the Lord of hosts, I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem, and to pray before the Lord. 
Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Here endeth the first lesson. The Te Deum Laudamus. We praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. Do thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee. The father of an infinite majesty, thine adorable true and only son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou didst humble thyself to be born of a virgin. When thou hast overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name ever world without end. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy be upon us as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted, let me never be confounded. Here beginneth the gospel according to St. Mark. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness, and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost." And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Here endeth the second lesson. The Benedictus. Mm-hmm. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets. 
which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he swore to our forefather Abraham that he would give us, that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people, for the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit, let us pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O God, may clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. The Collect for the Second Sunday after the Epiphany. Almighty and everlasting God, who dost govern all things in heaven and earth, Mercifully hear the supplications of thy people and grant us thy peace all the days of our life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collects for Peace and Grace. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, again, I say good morning. You may recall from last week that I mentioned that the earliest celebrations of the Feast of the Epiphany commemorated numerous aspects of Jesus' earthly life and ministry. And you may also recall that while the Western Church focuses mainly on the visitation of the Magi, the Eastern Church focuses more on the baptism of the Lord. That was kind of the main of those many events that were celebrated. And our Lord's baptism really does loom large in the earliest celebrations of the Feast of the Epiphany. Yet, by the time of the Reformation, the Western Church, both Catholic and Protestant, did not have a day set aside to commemorate Christ's baptism. Modern liturgies have typically made the first Sunday after the Epiphany the Feast of the Baptism of Christ to kind of rectify this situation. But 
Many churches celebrate the Feast of the Epiphany on that Sunday in the octave. In other words, for most of the time, that's going to be the Sunday after the Epiphany. And so, so the, uh, the, the celebration of the baptism is still often given short shrift. <laughs> Our own American 1928 Book of Common Prayer did something a little bit different. It shifted the traditional gospel readings for Epiphany 2 through 4, uh, forward a week, and inserted today's lesson, Mark's account of Jesus' baptism, into the second Sunday after the Epiphany. Now, I'm pretty... Typically, I'm pretty critical of the 20th century tinkering with the liturgy. I do think that on the part of the American prayer book, this was a wise move because it gives us the opportunity to remember and reflect upon the Lord's baptism and what it means for our own baptisms. (coughs) Excuse me. After all, uh, we, we recognize baptism as the sacrament of our initiation into the visible church, the sacrament of our regeneration, and indeed the sign of membership in the new covenant. So that is, baptism is a big deal, and it's a good thing to take time each year to think about it. So please open your Bibles to Mark 1, beginning at the first verse. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So in St. Mark's account of the gospel, uh, we see the story jumping right in. That's the way that the gospel begins. Now in the last couple of weeks, we've read the infancy narrative, the Christmas story in both the uh, gospel accounts according to St. Luke and St. Matthew. We also had on Christmas Day the opening of St. John's account, giving us a very spiritual and and, and kind of cosmological introduction to the gospel. St. Mark, on the other hand, begins just before Jesus' ministry with an account of John the Baptist. Now, more specifically, St. Mark begins with this phrase we just read here, as it is written in the prophets, and then he quotes the prophetic description of St. John the Baptist's ministry. And we talked about this, St. John the Baptist, a couple weeks ago in Advent, so we're not going to get into the specifics of the prophecy again. But it is important to note that that there is a very intentional and pre-planned connection between what we see in the Old Testament and what we will see um, in the gospel accounts. So always pay attention whenever the New Testament says, as it is written, as it is written. Let's pick up with verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of, of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. So the prophecy in verses 2 and 3 talked about preparing the way of the Lord, and we see then here how that happens, by John baptizing and preaching to the people of Judea and Jerusalem as they confess their sins. And the substance of John's preaching was repentance. You need to turn from your sins and turn to God. And there's someone else coming. There's an expectation. The Messiah is on his way. Now, when we look at the Levitical system back in the Old Testament, the ceremonial law commanded by God through Moses, we do see a lot of ritual washings. So by this, we see that baptism in of itself was pretty typical for Old Testament worship. And indeed, John's father was Zechariah the priest, so John himself would have been one of the Levitical priests by birth, and therefore he would be authorized to officiate and administer all of those Old Testament washings. But the kind of baptism John is administering is not something we see in the Old Testament. This is not an issue of ritual purity or ritual impurity, which is the main reasons why one would be baptized in the Old Testament. It's not being done at the mikvah, the ritual bath in either the temple or the local synagogue. No, rather, what John is doing here is a sign of repentance from actual sin 
and it's taking place in the wilderness. Now, some scholars have postulated that John may have been applying certain Second Temple era customs of baptizing Gentiles who convert to Judaism, and we see that happening even down to this day when people convert to Judaism. So what, what, what these scholars are suggesting is that um, in their repentance, the Jewish people, Judea and Jerusalem, who were coming down to John were kind of placing themselves into a similar position as a pagan convert might. Now, Alfred Edersheim, who is a 19th century Anglican priest and scholar um, who had converted from Orthodox Judaism, in his book on the life and times of Jesus the Messiah, he postulates another possibility based on another Old Testament temporary baptism, something that doesn't happen again and again, which took place on the foot of Mount Sinai itself. So when we turn back to Exodus chapter 19, God is preparing the Israelites to receive the Ten Commandments as well as the rest of the law of Moses on Mount Sinai. So only Moses would go up Mount Sinai and anybody else who touched the mountain would be put to death. But even when they were preparing to hear God's word from Moses when he came down from the mountain, that required the people to prepare themselves and part of that preparation, ritually speaking, included refraining from sexual uh, relations with their wives, as well as a ritual washing. So what, what we have here is a one-time baptism to prepare to receive God's law, to prepare to receive God's word written. So Edersheim then is suggesting that we have something similar happening with John the Baptist at the River Jordan. John is preparing these penitent Israelites to receive the word made flesh in a similar manner to the way that Moses prepared the Exodus generation of Israelites to receive God's word written. This then brings us to verse 8, John's contrast between his baptism and the baptism to come. John says this, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he, that is the Messiah, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. John's baptism is preparatory and penitential, but the Messiah is going to bring a greater baptism. John's baptism would be a washing in water to signify repentance, turning from sin. The Messiah's baptism would be a washing in the Holy Spirit to both signify and accomplish regeneration, to accomplish new life. This contrast is probably the most important feature of the text that many of the uh, the uh, church fathers pointed out. So St. John Chrysostom, for example, he points out that John's baptism was a preparation for true pardon. After all, he notes, the Lord had not yet become the sacrificial victim to wash away sins, nor had the Holy Ghost descended upon the people at Pentecost. By repenting now, John Chrysostom argues, the people would be better to, pre to better prepared to believe when the full gospel was offered later on. Similarly, St. Jerome points out that full forgiveness could only come from the cross, so those baptized by John would be preparing for a future remission of sins that would come when the Holy Spirit makes them truly holy. And uh, uh, St. Jerome writes this, no baptism can be called perfect except that which depends on the cross and resurrection of Christ. And indeed, when we turn to the Acts of the Apostles, we see a few instances where the Apostles encountered those who believe in Jesus, but they had only been baptized with John's baptism. And what tips the Apostles off that these folks, uh, these would-be disciples, had not yet received Christian baptism, had not yet fully come into the church, had not been united to Christ in the sacrament, was that they didn't even know there was a third person of the Trinity. That is, these folks, these people who had only received the baptism of John, hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> in the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus tells the disciples to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So how could those who, have, who, have, who hadn't even heard of the Holy Ghost have received Christian baptism? And what we see the apostles doing to, um, to, uh, to these folks who had only received John's baptism, we see them administering true Christian baptism along with the laying on of, of apostolic hands. And after that, the Holy Spirit visibly falls on them with signs and wonders. 
Now, Christian baptism today does not always come with signs and wonders, although I'm told sometimes it does. By the promises we read about in the New Testament, we can be assured that the Holy Ghost is indeed present and he's the one working in baptism because he is the one who bestows the invisible grace of the sacraments. In verse 9 of our gospel, Jesus himself is then baptized both with water and the Holy Spirit. Verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There are a few things in these verses that uh, have always struck me as profound for our faith. So first of all, we see that Jesus submitted to baptism despite having no sins of which he needed to repent. And we're going to discuss that a little bit more presently. Secondly, we see that all three persons of the Trinity are present in this account. This tells us that the doctrine of the Trinity is not merely something that the church makes up at the Council of Nicaea, but rather the Trinity is biblical. We see it right here. It also shows us that while we worship one God in three persons, those three persons are distinct in their personhood. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. After all, all three persons in our Gospel reading are, are acting independently. Now, the third thing we have here is that as the Spirit descends on, and that is he baptizes Jesus, we see the Father speaking his pleasure over the Son. And again, Jesus didn't need to hear his Father's approval. He surely knew that approval quite intimately. But those who witnessed the baptism needed to hear it, as do we today, because that has profound implications, not only for who Jesus is, but also for who we are in Christ. And again, we're going to address that a little bit more presently. So among scholars, teachers, and other theologians, there's a wide debate today on why Jesus needed to be baptized. Modern scholars just frankly don't agree and many of them will kind of just chalk this up to be a kind of a confusing issue. We see a lot less confusion among the church fathers. Um, In fact, while the fathers are by no means monolithic and they present a wide array of views and opinions on many theological topics and issues, they do generally all agree on the basics of baptism and the Lord's Supper. When it comes to Jesus' own baptism, this statement by St. Gregory Nazianzen, one of the champions of Trinitarian Orthodoxy, summarizes the patristic perspective best. He writes this, As a man he was baptized, but absolved sins as God. He needed no purifying rites himself. His purpose was to hallow the water. So in other words, Jesus was baptized to make our baptism holy. His baptism makes our baptism effective. And all of the fathers agree that we can trust God to make us holy, to set us apart, to unite us to Christ in our baptisms. Why? Because Jesus himself made the waters of baptism holy. And just then as the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus in his baptism, so do does the Holy Spirit come upon us in our baptism. Just as the Father declared his pleasure with his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, at the Lord's baptism, so does the Father declare his pleasure on us as his adopted sons in Jesus Christ. This does not mean that we are to be presumptuous when it comes to our baptisms. That's often the uh, kind of the counter argument. It doesn't mean that we treat baptism as a ticket to heaven that permits us to live lives of sin with impunity. That's not what this means. No, the Christian life is one of repentance. Jesus was without sin, but we are not. (laughs) And thus, we must always be turning from our sins back to Christ as long as we're in this mortal life of struggle with our fallen flesh. As article number 16, uh, which is titled of sin after baptism, says, After we have received the Holy Ghost, we may depart from grace given and fall into sin, and by the grace of God we may arise again and amend our lives. And therefore they are to be condemned which say they can no more sin as long as they live here, or deny the place of forgiveness to such as truly repent. 
Um, you want to pretend that you don't sin after baptism? That's not true. You want to pretend that you have that um, if you sin after baptism, you can't be forgiven? That's also not true. No, we always have the opportunity to repent. And baptism is the beginning of that journey. So should you, as a baptized Christian, fall into even grievous sin, should you you backslide, as we often say, from living after the faith, the solution is not to get re-baptized and reconvert and pretend that that sin meant you weren't a Christian. No, the solution is to repent and to return to the grace given by God. How much more so is this for the so-called everyday sins that each of us commit on an all-too-regular basis? So trust God that he has made you holy in your baptism because this is the promise that God himself has made in Christ's baptism. That trust, that faith in God, will indeed empower you to live out the grace of your baptism, to live a life of true holiness in conformity with God's word. That's how you know, by the way, that it's true holiness. All of our must believe and must do aspects of faith and morals, everything we must believe, everything we must see as as obligatory to the Christian life comes from Holy Scripture. So this then brings us back to our the beginning of our gospel passage as it is written in the prophets. So as much as John's baptism and Christian baptism are new covenant concepts in their specifics, the Old Testament contains many, many allusions to that baptism to come, foreshadowings or types, we would say, of Christian baptism. Christian baptism is indeed hinted at in the Old Testament on many occasions. The older editions of the prayer book include at the beginning of the baptismal liturgy a passage that we will often call the flood prayer in liturgical circles. So this prayer was sadly removed from our 1928 edition, but it has been happily restored in the current provincial prayer book of 2019. So in the language of the old 1662 edition, the flood prayer reads like this. Almighty and everlasting God, who of thy great mercy did save Noah and his family in the ark from perishing by water, and also did safely lead the children of Israel, thy people, through the Red Sea, figuring thereby thy holy baptism, and by the baptism of thy well-beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in the river Jordan, didst sanctify the water to the mystical washing away of sin, we beseech thee for thine infinite mercies that thou wilt mercifully look upon this child or this person, if it's somebody older, and wash him and sanctify him with the Holy Ghost, that he, being delivered from thy wrath, may be received into the ark of Christ's church, and being steadfast in faith, joyful through hope, and rooted in charity, may so pass the waves of this troublesome world, that finally he may come to the land of everlasting life, there to reign with thee, world without end, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So just as God used the ark to save humanity in the days of the flood, just as God used the Red Sea to save the Israelites from bondage to Egypt, so too does God use our baptisms to save us, all because Jesus made the waters of baptism holy. This is why then we remember Christ's baptism with such joy. This is why we keep the promises God made through our own baptisms at the forefront of our minds as we live the life of repentance. As God said of Jesus in his baptism, so he says of you and yours, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we say this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We continue with the prayer for those in civil authority. O Lord, our governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to thy merciful care, that being guided by thy providence, we may dwell secure in thy peace. Grant to the President of the United States and to all in authority, wisdom and strength to know and do thy will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness, and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in thy fear, through Jesus Christ our Lord who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, 
Send down upon our bishops and other clergy and upon the congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men, that thou wouldest be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially, we pray for thy holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are any ways afflicted or distressed, in mind, body, or estate. That it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings, and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who hast given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests, Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>